All right, good morning and welcome to the FORCE 2023 conference. Uh, I'm ex so excited to welcome you to our third virtual event. Um, as Cora said, my name is Todd Carpenter and I serve as president of the board of directors of FORCE 11. It has been uh, 12 years since the first Beyond the PDF meeting in San Diego and the future of research communications gathering in Darstuhl, Germany. Separately, these two meetings set our community in the direction of exploring ways in which we can transform how research researchers disseminate their work, which eventually led to the formation of Force 11 as an organization. Those were certainly exciting times. It was obvious that there needed to be a more robust ecosystem for communicating scholarly outputs, and we could just begin to discern what some of the critical elements could be beyond digitized version of, of physical journal pages. Data had increasingly become shared, software was being recognized as critical, protocols, computational outputs, visualizations had all become increasingly important elements in the replicability of science. If a transformation was going to take place in how science was supported, we needed something more than articles. We needed a new ecosystem. And over the past dozen-ish years, we've made great strides towards achieving some of those goals. Data is regularly being shared, it's being assigned DOIs, researchers are increasingly citing it as one of their outputs. Consistent reporting on usage is growing because of the e I ecosystem of identifiers and metadata. Best practices for data citation, data usage, as well as ethical approaches to sharing data have all been advanced within FORCE 11. The FORCE 11 conference is where ideas can be exchanged and advanced in the hopes that they will take root and eventually grow and flourish. Many ideas have had to start at our annual conference. It was about 10 years ago when a number of us thought we could endeavor to get momentum behind the ideas of data citation and encourage researchers to start sharing their data. That work developed into the data citation principles, which have had lasting impact through the growth of data site, the development of the FAIR principles and other efforts that Force 11 has been involved in. Hopefully during the meeting, one of you will feel inspired in the next couple of days to advance your own big ideas. And we're hoping that this year's program will inspire you to get more involved and remain engaged in the work at Force 11. Throughout the program, perhaps you'll discuss the next big project that Force 11 will pursue. Or you might attend a discussion where that allows you to improve some corner in this vast landscape. If something moves you, please don't just keep it to yourselves. We're here to help bring those ideas into reality. So let us know what your ideas are and how we can help pull the resources behind them to get them moving. One of the things that amazes me the most about Force 11 is the breadth and depth of those who participate, not only in the working groups, but the range of committees that are committed to keeping Force 11 moving. So finally, before we begin, I'd like to thank the two conference co-chairs, Cora at Crossroth and Heather Staines at Delta Think. They stepped in admirably and ably as they manage the conference committee that helped put together this week's work. Of course, in true Force 11 style, every effort within our organization is driven by a team of volunteers. Every member of the conference committee rolled up their sleeves and worked hard to pull together this conference. So thank you, we, all owe, we owe them a great debt of gratitude. gratitude. So I promised Cora and Heather that I would be brief. So with that, I will pass it back to Cora. And on behalf of the board of Force 11, we wish you a interesting and engaging event, and I hope you enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Todd. Um, and uh, also um, something to, to point out is that uh, we are uh, also very grateful to our, all our sponsors supporting, for supporting us uh, and this event. Um, and finally, uh, a few words of housekeeping. Uh, given that this is an online event, it's obviously minimal. 
Uh, but still, uh, you're here, so I imagine you probably uh, have found your, your way uh, to our sh uh, schedule and shed. Uh, and please continue to peruse it uh, throughout this uh, event uh, for joining details uh, to different sessions. Um, and uh, also, if you wish, for the invitation to, the, um, to our Slack channel for Force 11 uh, hyphen conference on Force 11 Slack to discuss any of those ideas and, um, and any inspirations that Todd has mentioned, we hope, uh, will have risen. Uh, we want this event to be enjoyable for everyone uh, and uh, a productive one. So to aid that, uh, we hope to uphold, for everyone to uphold the Force 11 Code of Conduct, a link to which is also circulating on the slides uh, that, uh, in the background. So you can, you can take note of that uh, and you can also find it on Shed. Uh, and uh, as I said, please join the conversations uh, on our um, conference Slack channel on Force 11. Uh, and in case of any uh, technical difficulties, please um, either contact us uh, through the help desk channel on Force 11 uh, or email directly admin at force11.org uh, and Samuel will be uh, swiftly at your aid. Uh, before we start our keynote, I just wanted to point out that afterwards we hope to have a lively Q&A, uh, which will be moderated by Simon Wickling uh, of the Charles Strutt University. Uh, so I don't know, Simon, you might get one to give a wave. Uh, and uh, uh, without further ado, uh, hopefully, uh, I uh, give you Professor Lucy Montgomery. Lucy uh, leads the Innovation and uh, Knowledge Communication Research Program at the, Curtin, uh, at the Culture and Technology um, Center at the Curtin University. And she's also a co-lead of the uh, Curtin Open Knowledge uh, Initiative, which is a strategic re research uh, project exploring how big data can help universities understand their performance as open knowledge institutions. Uh, her own research uh, is uh, covering topics uh, or exploring uh, how uh, open access and open knowledge are transforming the landscape of research production, uh, sharing and use in China. And her latest co-authored book is currently uh, up for community review uh, at MIT Press. Lucy, please take us away. You do need to unmute on Zoom, I think. Right, okay. Let's try again. So and now we can hear you clearly. You can hear and see my slides, hopefully. Can you? Yes, all, all in perfect order. Okay, great. All right, so thanks very much. And it really is a huge honour to have been invited to give this talk. And I want to uh, start by acknowledging that I'm joining this event from Wajak Noongar Buja, or Wajak uh, Noongar country, which is the unceded land of the Wajak people of the Noongar nation in the southwest corner of Western Australia, which is where Curtin University is located and where I'm lucky enough to work and live. So I've asked Simon to share a link in the chat window to the Koki Open Access dashboard. Um, if you're like me and you like to fidget a bit while you listen to talks, uh, then I invite you to um, click through to that link and to explore the dashboard. I'm actually going to be talking about the dashboard in the second half of my talk, and I'm conscious that we want to leave a bit of time for Q&A. So if people uh, click around, it will actually be entirely relevant uh, to what I'm saying. And... <laughs> Nothing, uh, yeah, that we should do anything other than encourage. So please go ahead and have a play. Uh, so, right. So I've broken uh, my talk into two parts. And the first focuses on the role that open approaches have played in translating technological possibility into meaningful change for people with type 1 diabetes. Uh, and in the second part of my talk, I'm going to introduce the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative, which is a project that emerged as a response to a local problem, but which also has the potential to help make big global data sets visible and useful to people and communities who are trying to solve their own problems. Uh, so I've chosen to start a talk about Koki and what we're doing with open data at global scale with a story about the diabetes community, 
because some of the challenges that we're facing are challenges that patient communities have been wrestling with for a long time. They're challenges like ensuring that people can trust the systems that they use, the presence of big commercial markets and really problematic monopolies, uh, a disconnect between what's technically possible and what's available to users and the need to find ways of helping infrastructure and institutions to move forward without giving up control of the things that we care about. So I'm going to begin by inviting you to imagine me a few months ago scrolling through my Facebook on my phone on a Saturday morning feeling exhausted um, by the disconnect between what I know is technically possible using open scholarly data and the realities of the evaluation systems that we're dealing with as researchers operating in an Australian university. So it was basically my usual Saturday morning moment of decompression. And I paused my scrolling on a post by a friend who had just lost her dear friend, Katie DeSimone, to cancer. So Katie DeSimone was an active member of the DIY looping community. She was a blogger, a pioneer and a mentor. And the post that I paused on was this one. It was by my friend Melissa, who I met when I lived in London. So Melissa's an American living in the UK. She's a busy mum. She's a tech startup entrepreneur and she has type one diabetes. I've watched Melissa's social media feed with fascination over the years, because every year on the 14th of November for World Diabetes Day, she posts a bite by bite account of her day and the decisions and adjustments she has to make about how much insulin to push through her insulin pump, depending on whether she exercises, what she eats, whether she decides to sip juice instead of water, and what her body decides it's doing at any particular moment. So this is an example of the sort of stuff Melissa posts. Fish tacos for dinner, complicated decisions about the correct bolus of insulin for fresh corn tortillas, interesting looking graphs of blood glucose and insulin. Um, and for me, it's like some kind of mathematics game with delicious looking food and consequences if either she or her technology get it wrong. Um, and I really love these posts. So when I saw Melissa posting about the, the loss of a DIY looping mentor and pioneer and the impact that looping had on her ability to safely have a second baby, I was really intrigued. I hadn't heard of looping, so I wanted to know what is looping? Why would it be DIY? Uh, why would it need documentation and how did it get Melissa's blood glucose levels from pretty great if you're not pregnant to perfectly within the much tighter target range for pregnancy? And actually, it turns out that looping is pretty straightforward. A lot of people listening to this talk have probably heard of it already. Some of you might even have type 1 and be loopers or know people who are involved in this open innovation movement. But in case you haven't heard about this very cool example of community-led innovation, I'm going to attempt an explanation. So in the context of diabetes, looping refers to creating a digital connection between a continuous glucose monitor and an insulin pump or closing the loop. By allowing information to be shared between a glucose monitor and an insulin pump, it becomes possible to automate the process of calculating and adjusting insulin doses in response to glucose readings. And when I knew Melissa in London, she wasn't yet looping. So some of my most vivid memories of talking to her involved watching as she was responding to some kind of beeping alarm by manually adjusting her insulin dose on a device that looked like an old-fashioned pager, which was her insulin pump. So even in 2013, it seemed odd to me that she would need to make constant manual adjustments. It wasn't ever the only thing she was doing. She would also be holding a drink, chatting about work, dodging my hyperactive toddler and thinking about whether she would be able to squeeze lunch in between a trip to the gym and her next meeting. And so the insulin adjustments were just an extra thing that she needed to manage all the time in order to stay healthy and alive. It looked inconvenient, a little bit dangerous and generally not ideal to me. But without a connection between a glucose monitor and an insulin pump and an algorithm to calculate insulin adjustments, a human has to make all the decisions. 
So if you're an adult with type 1 diabetes, it's something that you need to do. If you're a parent, you need to do it for your child. Um, blood glucose levels don't just need to be monitored during the day. They also need to be monitored at night, every night for your whole life. There are no cheat days. If you get it wrong, you'll feel rotten. And not only that, but you or your child could die. So it's pretty high stakes um, maths. Closed loop systems that allow a computer to adjust an insulin pump's output in response to data from a continuous glucose monitor, monitor are a real game changer. They mean that people with type 1 diabetes can share the mental load of managing their blood glucose with an algorithm and they make it possible to sleep safely through the night. So for parents, it means greater confidence that a child with type 1 is going to be safe at school or able to live an independent life as an adult. And actually, it's not such a new idea. So the first closed loop artificial pancreas system, which made adjustments to insulin dosage in response to data from a blood glucose monitor, was invented in the early 1960s by Arnold Kaddish. It used on-off salvos to administer insulin in response to blood glucose readings. Um, and I actually think it looks really cool, but it was the size of an army backpack and it didn't take off. It was easier to just test blood, calculate insulin and give yourself a shot using a syringe. Um, but in 1974, a computer controlled closed loop system called the BioStator was developed. And again, it wasn't exactly portable, but it had applications. So the UK purchased its first artificial pancreas in 1977 to help manage blood sugar levels for people with type 1 diabetes during surgery and childbirth. Um, and these were all exciting developments and a sign that technology was headed in the right direction. The future for people with type 1 diabetes would only get safer and more convenient. And the answer to that is it's sort of yes and sort of no. So insulin pumps improved and by the 2000s, wearable glucose monitors were coming available as an alternative to pricking your finger uh, a dozen times a day. Type 1 diabetes were assured that a world in which type 1 diabetes and maybe even some forms of type 2 diabetes could be managed using an artificial pancreas were just around the corner and somehow it just never arrived. The gravity of the risks involved in managing type 1 diabetes made carrying out clinical trials expensive and unattractive. Approval requirements made changing the design of devices in response to user feedback difficult. Anxieties about data security, intellectual property, regulatory frameworks intended to protect patients, and the complexities of global markets for medical devices all resulted in an innovation pipeline that was out of step with the needs of people living with diabetes. So the we are not waiting hashtag that Melissa used in her post was a reference to a global movement of people with diabetes using open source tools to create change. So this is the list of the things that the community refuse to wait for, and it's pretty powerful. For me, it's maybe most powerful because it highlights the extent to which the type one community was being failed by regulatory frameworks and institutions that are supposed to keep patients and consumers safe and to help markets function effectively. Um, the things you know that people were refusing to wait for include peace of mind that our children are safe, ethical safeguards for the protection of patient privacy and the security of their data and interoperability. And it was this space that people like Dana Lewis stepped into. Dana wanted an alarm loud enough to wake her up if her blood glucose dropped in the night. It wasn't that complicated, but she had to hack her device to achieve it. And she and other people living with type 1 diabetes discovered that the fastest and easiest way for them to get technology that worked for their bodies and lives was just to adapt it. So in 2013, Dana helped to found OpenAPS, which is a community that shares open source code, documentation and information needed to set up DIY loop closed systems. It was a precursor to the system that my friend Melissa uses. And Dana was part of a groundswell of people frustrated by systems that were failing to deliver for them and their families, being empowered by changes in technology and seriously motivated to create something better. 
So this then is a case of a community stepping up when markets aren't working and the institutions that are supposed to be keeping them safe have failed. Ultimately, the We Are Not Waiting movement succeeded in speeding innovation, unclogging clinical trial processes and prompting medical device suppliers and regulators to get artificial pancreases into the hands of patients. Regulators are starting to catch up and approval processes are now moving forward again. So that means that these systems are becoming much more widely available to patient communities around the world. So late last year, the Australian government announced that it's going to pay for commercial hybrid closed loop systems for people with type 1 diabetes. Melissa could now access one through the NHS if she wanted to. And statutory funding criteria for the commercial hybrid closed loop systems are on their way in the UK. This is really becoming technology that everyone can access. And that's a really big win. But commercial systems are still really far from perfect. Users have to trust manufacturers with data about their bodies. Commercial systems are hard to customise and adapting them voids warranties and user agreements. And for a significant proportion of the type one community, open source DIY solutions are still simply better. So if you have the skill and the confidence to engage with DIY looping systems, the approach can provide more control, greater transparency, and greater scope to customize systems to suit your body and your life. Uh, open source and DIY approaches are also providing people with diabetes with greater control over how and when new innovations are incorporated into the systems that they use, providing an alternative to being stuck on a timeline that's being dis dictated by dysfunctional markets and slow regulators. So Melissa's posts about the We Are Not Waiting movement and DIY looping were a powerful reminder for me of the role that communities play in turning technological possibility into meaningful change, as well as the really complex relationship that global systems and markets have with the needs of people who are trying to solve problems in their own local context. So in the next part of this talk, I'm going to explain why thinking about why technological possibility, um, or thinking about what technological possibility means at both global and local scale is so important for Koki. And I'm also going to speak very briefly about the lessons that I think we as open source innovators who want to make the world a better place could take from the We Are Not Waiting movement. So like many projects, Koki is a project that was born out of frustration. Cameron, Naylan and I started the Curtain Open Knowledge Initiative in 2018 because we wanted to solve a particular local problem. So Cameron and I both arrived back in an Australian university after working on open access publishing projects in the UK. And we were really worried by the extent to which conversations within our university about research were being framed in terms of league tables produced by commercial organisations. So I was the director of a research centre and I had a moment of horror when sitting in a room full of research leaders from across the university, the vice chancellor told us that she really valued research because it pushed Curtin up the rankings. And the people sitting in the room with me had devoted their lives to research. We'd all made big personal sacrifices. We were fighting in the trenches for funding and everyone was passionate about what they were doing because they thought it would make a positive difference in the world. Um, but the stories that the university was telling us about why we mattered focused on the contribution that we made to league tables that were being compiled by commercial data aggregators and media corporations. Uh, and at the same time, uh, we had noticed that conversations about open access and open science had really stalled in Australia. So maybe Australia hadn't gone backwards in absolute terms, but open was quickly becoming a gold standard for good research in the rest of the world. And Australia just wasn't moving. So Cameron and I were both sort of coming back into this system from the outside and, and sort of looking around and thinking, hang on, there's something that really is a bit, you know, not quite right here. 
So instead of declaring our frustration and just heading back overseas, we decided that uh, maybe we should stick it out and try a more strategic approach. So in a world where what gets measured gets done, we thought, hey, maybe we can create some tools for measuring things that can help to centre the conversation at our university on the aspects of research and universities that we really value. So we were interested in questions like, what does open knowledge change? What would a university as an open knowledge institution look like? What kinds of information might a university need to support a shift from closed to open? And what kinds of information do funders, policymakers, and research communities need to support open research? Um, but yeah, we understood that we were operating in a landscape where rankings made a really big difference to uh, conversations. So we pitched an idea for a curtain open knowledge index to our DVC of research, thinking we can package our values up in a format that will be familiar. Maybe, maybe we can get it through. Um, and our DVC of research got the idea really quickly. And he, he thought it was actually something that he'd been thinking about and he uh, said okay sure go ahead I think you should do this and he made the funding available so we were incredibly lucky and in 2018 we were able to set up the Curtin Open Knowledge Initiative so Koki is a humanities faculty project it's based in the Centre for Culture and Technology but it's also now one of the biggest programs of research within the Curtin Institute for Computation so we have a team of more than 15 people um, and it includes a substantial team of data scientists and software developers, but also researchers focused on Indigenous perspectives, gender, the statistical interpretation of big data sets, and the transformation of scholarly communication. And the first thing we did as a research team in 2018 was to pull together people whose approaches we admired from different disciplines uh, and to lock them up with us for a week-long book sprint. Um, and the result was a manifesto that sets out the framework that's driven our approach to capturing data related to scholarly communication. Um, and it's also shaped the approach that we've taken to thinking about what's in our data sets, as well as how we build systems that are as open, transparent and community engaged as we can possibly make them. Because we started this project at a moment of new technological possibility, we've been able to ride a wave of publicly available data infrastructures that have allowed us to do some really amazing things. So ideally, we do want to be able to engage with data that's more diverse and inclusive than current commercially available data sets. So we've got some projects that are exploring and engaging with data sets that are only available at a national scale or which are qualitative or which have to be kept private for some reason. But we're also engaging with genuinely big data that relates to global scholarly communication. We stopped counting the number of data points captured in the Koki data set a few years ago because counting really big data doesn't make a lot of sense. Um, but about five years ago, the last time I could get someone to give me a number, we were at something like 12 trillion data points. So it's properly big data. And we're using cloud-based computing approaches to link together open data sets and to explore the stories that data can tell us about open access and scholarly communication. So you can see here that in this slice of our data, we've got information about publications relating to almost 90,000 institutions. We're also capturing data from a whole range of sources and we've linked it together in a way that allows us to explore it through different lenses. So we can explore the profiles of institutions, countries, funders, publishers, groups and collaborators. So Open Alex, Unpaywall, Open Citations, Crossref and other projects have done a really fantastic job of creating an infrastructure layer that's allowing us uh, that's allowing for a paradigm shift in the questions that can be asked about global research landscapes, as well as the perspectives that can be captured through data. And groups like ours are knitting data together in ways that we hope other people are going to be able to build on. So the data that we have isn't perfect, but it's clear to us that we've reached a phase change moment in terms of what can be done with data about scholarly communication. We're at a point where open data 
sets aren't just good, they're arguably better than closed proprietary data sets that still drive league table style analysis of universities and research. Um, open data sets are better because they're more transparent, they're more flexible, they can be linked together to suit local needs and to ask questions that matter in local contexts. And we can use open publicly available data sets to help us to contextualise data that maybe can't be made public because it's sensitive. So those are exactly the sorts of things that the Koki research team is doing. So we've been looking at broad patterns relating to the openness of research communication at global scale. And you can see here that there's a global trend towards open access. In the data that we can see, uh, which is pulling cross-ref DOIs of around 45% of all published research is being made open globally. We've been interrogating our own national context. So you can see that 40% of research publications with at least one Australian author are currently open. And if we wanted to be generous in our interpretation, we could say that Australia's open access performance is perhaps middling. Um, we've been asking questions about where the top performers on open access are in the world and why Australia is nowhere to be seen. So this isn't a simple case of wealthier countries performing better than less wealthy countries. Low and middle income countries are leading the world when it comes to the overall proportion of their research outputs that are open access. And if we just look at countries with more than 10,000 publications a year, Australia's nearest neighbour, Indonesia, is leaving us in the dust with more than 80% of research open access. And we've also been using open data to explore questions that we care about as a project, including about relationships between open access and diversity. So everyone's now familiar with the concept of open access citation advantages and the fact that papers that are made available in open access receive more citations than papers that are behind a paywall. And we wanted to know whether making research open access also increases the diversity of the communities who are accessing and using that research. And it turns out that we can see qualitative differences in the diversity of the researchers who cite open access publications when we compare them to groups that cite closed publications. Open access publications receive more diverse citations than closed publications, and we can see it happening. Um, so you can see here that open access research outputs are outperforming closed publications on diversity when we measure diversity according to diversity of countries, diversity of regions, diversity of subregions, and diversity of the fields of research that are citing a particular paper. So this is a graph that's showing the Shannon Diversity Index for all of those measures. And we've been asking questions about the openness of research on a particular topic. So for example, what proportion of the research on climate change is open? And so we can, um, we can pull data together and put it into dashboards to explore openness by topic. Uh, and we've even been exploring openness through lenses of geography and language. So this is a screenshot from a dashboard developed as part of a collaboration with the Australian Institute of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Studies. Uh, and it's a first experimental effort to explore ways of presenting publications about First Nations Australians in a way that makes local languages visible, as well as geographic design divides between the people who are being spoken about in research and the institutions that are carrying out that research. So we can do a lot of um, really cool things with open data. And we've been having a really fun time exploring these data sets as a project. So groups like Open Alex, Unpaywall, Open Citations, Crossref, Orchid and others are creating an infrastructure layer that's allowing for a paradigm shift in the questions that can be asked about global research landscapes, as well as the perspectives that can be captured through open data. And Koki is knitting that data together in ways that we hope others are going to be able to build upon. So our code is open source and we're sharing it via GitHub. Um, and we have real uh, humans behind the code. So they all get genuinely excited when 
uh, people are using our code to tackle the Open Alex data set in their own projects or working with really big data sets around scholarly communication and pulling on our code. So don't hold back. Feel free to explore the GitHub. Um, but we also know that making code open source is nowhere near enough. So tools that lower barriers to engaging with data in local contexts are also hugely important. And at the beginning of this talk, I um, asked Simon to share that link about the Koki Open Access Dashboard. So the dashboard is one way that we're trying to help make open data about research and research communication more visible to people and communities that might want to use it. It provides a subset of our data in the form of a dynamic dashboard that uh, we've designed to uh, ensure it can operate in low bandwidth environments and quite a lot of care went into uh, the design of a dashboard that can work in different bandwidth settings. We've uh, kept it simple. So I'm now going to just second switch screens. Hopefully this is still working. So we've kept it simple. We've just got two tabs, which hopefully uh, you've explored already. Uh, we've got country and institution views. And if we click in to a country, uh, we can see more detailed information about open access in a particular location. Um, and all of this is pulling automatically. Uh, so we have automatic pull through from Wikipedia. The dashboard is updated monthly. And um, I think quite importantly, we hope we also now make data about countries and institutions available for download in CSV format as well as over here in JSON lines format. Uh, so it's a fairly simple dashboard, but it is actually surfacing an incredibly powerful data set. At the moment, we've got about 14,000 institutions uh, included in the dashboard. And when we finish implementing Open Alex, oh, sorry, we've got 8,000 now. And when we finish implementing Open Alex in the next couple of months, then we will be displaying data for 14,000 institutions globally. So we're not going to break any URLs if people want to link to an institution uh, page, but we are expanding the number of institutions that we display to include any institution with more than 700 publications in the new Open Alex um, data set. So, yeah, so I hope people will click around and we can have a bit of a conversation afterwards about filters and uh, whether or not this way of presenting data is actually better than an index or whether we uh, have just sold out. Um, back to my other screen. Okay, so with data sets this big and this global, it's easy for local context to get lost. Um, so we know that data about tens of thousands of universities is available. We know that we have data relating to research for almost every country on earth. We can see when things are wrong with data about our own publications. I think most researchers will know that that's something you can spot pretty instantly. Um, we can spot fairly quickly things that are wrong with data about our institution, our country, and sometimes even our region. But it's really hard for us to see what's missing in these big global scale data set for others. So we really do need people with local knowledge of their own research communication landscapes to start exploring and critiquing this huge vol volume of open data that is now becoming available around research and research communication. Um, so sort of we were very excited when we were asked if our dashboard could be embedded in Africa Archives open access country profiles for that reason, because we want people who understand their own local context to start looking at our dashboard and uh, to start having critical conversations about whether the numbers make sense for them and what we as a community can start doing to make these data sets better. 
So Koki is far from alone in wanting to ensure that open scholarly data is available to the people and communities who could benefit the most from it. Um, and we're not alone in wrestling with challenges of ensuring that tools and data are not just open, but they're also stable and sustainable. So raising awareness of the power of the open data sets that we can now play with, lowering barriers to exploring, critiquing and tinkering with big open scholarly data, and figuring out how we ensure that what we're building helps others to springboard ahead are all really big priorities for our project as we head into its next phase. So all of these are infrastructure problems. They're not things that we can solve alone. Um, and they relate to questions of how we build and sustain open scholarly infrastructures and how we rebalance commercial landscapes and how we tackle questions of transparency and trust and sustainability. But there are also problems that are going to be solved by people and communities. So as Melissa's post reminded me, global markets and institutions intended to increase trust don't always deliver the innovations that matter the most to the people who have the most to, to win or lose <laughs> from them. Some of the most important work is done by people solving intensely local problems and people who care about change, who are willing to share deep local knowledge and personal experience, mentor, support, advocate, innovate and inspire, can transform technological possibility into something that's really wonderful. So Open Alex, Unpaywall, Open Citations, Crossref and other projects have done a fantastic job of creating an infrastructure layer that's allowing for a paradigm shift in the questions that could be asked about global research landscapes, as well as the perspectives that can be captured through data, but it's going to take people like Melissa and Katie and communities of practice like Force 11 to turn those new possibilities into a brighter future. That's it from me. Thank you for allowing me to help kick off this year's conference. And congratulations on everyone involved for having made it so far. Thank you so much, Lucy. I'm sure everyone will join me in uh, in recognizing a really fascinating presentation about some really incredible, innovative, and important um, work. Um, now, I'm sure people have questions. Um, I believe that the the way the Zoom is set up is we can't un you can't unmute yourself, so we'll have to use the chat um, for uh, questions. Um, so if you can't find the chat, if like me you're on a small laptop screen, if you click on the three dots where it says more, uh, and and then at the top of that, there's the chat link that'll open the chat up. Um, there's one question in there already um, from Simon Worthington asking to, uh, to hear a bit more about the uh, climate change OA stats uh, and if there's a link to the dashboard. And um, Cameron's mentioned in the comments that it's part of a project with Creative Commons. But I wonder if you could say a little bit more about that, that climate change work? Yeah, so we, um, yeah. So, so that dashboard that I posted was actually something that Cameron knocked up, uh, I shouldn't, you know, fairly quickly uh, because we thought that it would be interesting, you know, Cameron thought, oh, I'll just have a play and see what we can do. Uh, and it's now evolved into a project that's a collaboration with Creative Commons. It's a funded project uh, that's uh, supporting Creative Commons in making data around the access to research needed to tackle climate change open. Uh, so we can probably, I can share a link to the description of that project. Some of the other work that's been going on has been the uh, work that Cameron and Bianca have been doing, looking at how open the publications that are referenced in the IPCC reports are. Uh, and so Cameron, I know, is in this call and he might be willing to share some links to that stuff too. But, um, yep, so Cameron's just shared the link to the 4 million, sorry, the, yeah, the four-year 4 million open climate campaign with Creative Commons. And he may also share a link to some of the work uh, that he's been doing with Bianca on uh, open access mm -hmm. in the citations included in those big climate related reports. 
Okay, thank you. There's a question in from Kate. Um, Kate's curious about the labels used in the dashboard instead of colours, so publisher open, other platform open. So how did you come up with these labels and was any user testing involved? Uh, well, right. So user testing is exactly our challenge. Um, there was thought that went into uh, the labels. We did decide uh, against green and gold, uh, partly because it's hard to tell always the difference between green, gold, diamond in the data sets. And also we know that there are some challenges around that. But so far, we haven't had a big user testing process with this dashboard because we're a research team running a research project and we have sort of been putting these things up with the resources that we have available. Um, and yeah, it's it's really, it's sort of an interesting gap, but without, I think, proper funding and support for projects like this one, they sort of have to be a bit dependent on the resources that are available to the teams that sit behind them. And we've been really focused on stability, on the things that we know uh, or we hope will make a big difference, like uh, ex making sure we have a dashboard that's easy to use in a low bandwidth setting, thinking about formats of data that we're sharing and making available and really good quality code and documentation that sits behind the dashboard. Uh, but yeah, user testing <laughs> and some kind of, yeah, would, would be nice. Thanks. Um, so Todd has asked about um, the kind of open access adoption by country and wondering if there's been any work done to identify the factors that are influencing that. So he cites the example of Indonesia, uh, Indonesia's very high OA performance numbers. Um, so what kind of work's being done to, to sort of understand the, the reasons for those numbers? Right. So we as a research team can't do all of it, but I think that, you know, that's also, they're the questions we also have. As soon as you start seeing the data, it becomes possible to start seeing patterns. And, and we can see, for example, um, the effects of big infrastructure development uh, around diamond open access in certain regions in the world. We can guess what we think is, you know, responsible for particular patterns in particular places. And there are also researchers uh, doing uh, incredibly important work that are located all over the world uh, who understand their own systems, their own policy landscapes, and who often take a look at the data and can see very quickly, um, you know, they understand what's going on in those data sets in ways that our team um, really would struggle to achieve. So I think really that is also my point. It is that that we are not the only team in the world that's doing research around uh, open access and patterns of open science. There's a, a lot of work that's going on in this space. Uh, and I think as a community, we've all got something to gain from not just access uh, or the availability of data in formats that we can't necessarily engage with, but a, a sort of user-friendly layer that sits in the middle that can break down some of the barriers to access and engagement uh, that can sort of widen out this conversation. Thanks. Uh, I, had a, I had a question actually around the institutional data because, you know, I, I, the, the, the rationale you gave for the kind of how league tables, you know, drive decisions at or at least inform thinking at high levels within universities. Um, and in I, I know, you know, when we've spoken in the past, there was thought went into actually publishing that institutional data and what the response or reaction might be. I wonder if could you talk a little bit about that and, and how have you had feedback? What's your sense of what the reaction to these numbers has been? Yeah, so so when we um first began this project and we realised that we could get quite uh, granular in data about the performance of individual institutions when it came to open access and their open access repositories, we were pretty cautious about just making that visible without getting back to institutions and saying, hey, have you seen this data? Would you like to take a look at it? We um, you know, didn't want to go ahead and just make data open 
uh, and make dashboards and visualizations publicly available uh, in a way that uh, might do anything other than support, particularly in the Australian context, uh, a community of often under-resourced librarians who were often doing their best to make open access work in a policy environment that hasn't always been supportive and helpful and friendly to that agenda. So we were fairly cautious. Um, and we sort of moved away from that at scale, partly because we had fairly good feedback from libraries and support for making the data more visible, but also because the feedback that we got when we sort of did a limited amount, when we tried uh, to engage with uh, IFL libraries and, and partners in other national contexts, it became apparent that access to some data that would um, have an application in their local context was really important to a lot of users. Um, and we realised that perhaps we're not best positioned to predict what people want to use this data for or how they're going to want to use it in local contexts. Uh, and we sort of have had to try and figure out a somewhere medium uh, in that spectrum of approaches. Do we keep it all closed so that we don't upset the people running repositories if there's a blip or it's not looking great? Or do we say, okay, this is going to be open and we're going to encourage people to come in, take a look, understand why the data looks good or not so good for themselves, and then hopefully start responding uh, in their own local context. And we opted for the second option just because of the scale of the data and the practicality of, of how we deal with it. A reminder as if one was needed of the, how political data can be. Um, there's another question from um, Simon. I get this is going back to, I guess, the first part of your, your presentation around public health departments and, and diabetes. So Simon asks, are you finding that public health departments or medical institutions are engaging with communities like the open looping community? And he sort of explains how his experience of this is mixed and some engage with open communities in innovative ways and others are, are more closed off? Well, we, um, we can't necessarily see that in this data, in the data that's in the Koki dashboard particularly easily. However, I do think that that whole question of uh, grey literature and uh, knowledge transfer and all of the, the interesting, not straight scholarly communication measured in citations, uh, parts of the landscape, um, you know, we have to figure out, well, we don't have to, but it would be really, really interesting to be able to see that activity in different ways. So one of the things in the Australian context I would love to add at some point is um, a link to the Analysis and Policy Observatory, the APO, so that we could see grey literature uh, and connections between policy-focused literature, policy-relevant documents and scholarly literature in our data set. And I think that, yeah, would be really interesting. And the other types of, of activity and data, um, yeah, that we could see around the openness and sort of knowledge transfer of all of this stuff that's happening, I think is a whole other set of really interesting challenges that we're not trying away from, but it's hard to do them necessarily at global scale in the way we can for some of the publications data at the moment. Thank you. I've just realized I missed a question earlier from Danny. So sorry about that, Danny. Um, it was around whether there have been any instances of change as a result of the that information being made public. The, the kind of institutional data. Well, I think, Danny, uh, I think that's why I was so, so exhausted when I was scrolling through my phone, uh, is that actually I don't think we've achieved the change that we were hoping for at our own institution necessarily. We've uh, discovered all sorts of challenges around disconnection. Um, I think that, you know, there are opportunities in the Australian landscape to... to, to maybe have some new conversations in the sort of next phase of era or around the university's accord um, sort of discussion. But I think that the really 
we do need some leadership for, at a high policy level in Australia and that there are structural um, challenges that groups like ours are really, I don't think we can do it on our own. We can do some, all sorts of really interesting things, but we do also need policy in our local use case context to play a role. Uh, and I think that for me, it's also one of the really fascinating contradictions about a project like this, where we can see this incredible global data. We can do amazing things with open data. We have huge support from our uh, DVC of research, uh, but our university is still operating in a market that's driven often by a focus on recruiting international students and the political economy of that pushes them towards really caring about university rankings. And yeah, that's not something that we can necessarily change, I think. Maybe we will next week, but as of this week, we haven't achieved it. Excellent. Um, I'll just flag that um, Kate asked a, a sort of local question about the data relating to her um, institution and, and Cameron's noted in the chat that there is a uh, report issue button. So I guess as you're encouraging people to, to look at this data, you'd encourage them to make use of that if there's there's anything that they're interested in or that they yes, can suggest absolutely. about Yes, absolutely. And in the lead up to this talk, our um, tech team also, yeah, added that more obvious link to our GitHub reporter technical issue if there is a problem. And that is, you know, it is actually a thing. So we, I think, with the number of institutions we're dealing with, if there is a problem with the way data is flowing through, sometimes there's something simple that needs fixing, we won't always be able to spot it. So we do actually now really need a community to go in and uh, look at data and to report issues. We think it's pretty good. The issues that are reported are, you know, pretty infrequent, but, but maybe that's just because no one's looking yet. <laughs> so... Excellent. Well, I'm keeping an eye on the time. We've got two minutes before the end of the hour. And the, as I've just put in the chat, the next session starts straight after this. So I, I guess we might wrap it up um, there. Sorry if I missed any last minute questions, but I don't think we, we should ask Lucy to address them in 30 seconds. Um, so um, thank you so much, Lucy, uh, for, for giving that talk and, and for answering all those questions. Um, it was really fascinating, and I'm sure we'll all agree it's it's really important work that that you and the um uh, that and, and Koki are doing. So um, we look forward to hearing more about it in the future. Um, I will just flag that I've put the link to the next um, conference session in the chat, so you don't have to head back to shed. Um, uh, and uh, there's a uh, talk supporting uh, bibliodiversity and open access book, book publishing by Judith uh, Fathala and sponsored data mobilization to increase quantity, openness and accessibility of public health data uh, by Scott Edmund. So please join us for that. Um, but before we go, let's, uh, let's uh, all thank Lucy once more um, for that and for opening the, the conference in such fine style. So thanks, Lucy. Thanks, Simon. Thanks, everyone.